Hello, my name is Harold Hafton, and welcome to Archaeological Minecraft. I'm a former archaeologist who enjoys playing Minecraft and thought it would be fun to combine the two. In the latest 1.20 snapshot, as many of you might have heard, Mojang is looking to change how villagers work. In that update, in order to get what many consider to be the quote-unquote best enchanted books, you need to train up a villager to master level, and then you're guaranteed to get one of those books depending on the biome that villager comes from. So for example, if you want to get a mending book, you can only get them from a master villager from a swamp village. However, there are no native swamp villages. So if you're going to want a villager in that biome, you need to build your own village. So in today's episode, I figured it'd be good to build a custom historical swamp village and talk about a fascinating Bronze Age culture while doing so, the Terramar culture. Now, I know I've been moving away from using these chalkboard talk sections in my video, and I've recently been jumping right from the intro into the build, but as I bet there are probably a number of you watching that haven't heard of the Terramar culture, I thought a bit of background would be helpful. Let me know in the comment sections if you even like these chalkboard sections or not, or let me know how I can improve them if there's a better way to talk through this kind of background. The Terramar culture was based out of the Po River Valley in the northeastern part of what is now the country called Italy. It's in the area of where modern-day Venice is located, just to its west, and also where Verona is located. You remember Verona from Romeo and Juliet, right? In Fair Verona is where our story lays its scene. The name Terramar is a bit interesting. It wasn't their native name for what they called themselves, but rather is a name that comes from the Black Earth or Terra Marna, in other words, marl earth, which is typically black, so it's a type of dirt. And that black earth was used by the native speakers of Italy at the time when the excavations really were kicking off. They would harvest that black earth and then use it kind of as mulch or fertilizer in their fields. The name has been a bit of a point of confusion based on what I researched, as some have pointed to Terramar maybe coming from the Latin, and thus in the Latin, Terra is earth and Mara is sea, so basically land sea. And I can see where maybe that could be a bit confusing as a Po River Valley is quite marshy. And as we'll discuss later with the Terramar culture, they did a lot to harness that low-lying marsh and built their buildings to accommodate that type of geography. So at first look, I can see where people might jump to that conclusion. But nope, the name came far after Latin was the language spoken in that area and comes from the Marl Earth, or in other words, Black Earth. The Terramar were a Bronze Age culture that dated to around 1700 to 1150 BC in the Middle and Late Bronze Age. In the earlier parts of the Middle Bronze Age, they seem to have moved into the Po River Valley or their population was bolstered and increased by migrants from the north and the west. Some have pointed to connections to a group of people from modern day Hungary based on a specific bronze sword type found in the Terramar grave goods that is strikingly similar to a bronze sword used in Hungary at that time. So that's led some to point that perhaps that's where the migrants or population influx came from. In the early period of the Middle Bronze Age, settlements tended to be small and consist of around 200 to 250 people, but located very closely together. Most sites at this time are around two kilometers or 1.2 miles from another. Barring trees or small hills blocking someone's view, that means they would be close enough to see from one village to another. Over time, as the Middle Bronze Age shifted into the Late Bronze Age, the villages grew larger and seemed to have consolidated. So, for example, multiple villages seemed to have been abandoned, and the populations from those villages shifted to all living in a much larger village. How much larger, I hear you wondering? Well, early in the Middle Bronze Age, the average village was around 2 hectares, or around 200,000 square meters. To put that in another way, that's around 200 meters by 300 meters in dimensions. As the Bronze Age was moving into the Late Bronze Age, the average village was a couple of dozen hectares large, with the largest one being around 60 hectares in size. Think of that comparatively, 60 hectares compared to 2 hectares, so quite a bit bigger. The economy was based on farming, specifically wheat and barley and herding, which focused on sheep and goats with some cattle. It was also based on metallurgy with fine examples of craftsmen focusing on bronze and copper work. They were also involved in long distance trade networks and were a key piece in connecting the German and Baltic regions with the Eastern Mediterranean. Here's how that plays out archeologically. Based on grave goods, 
you can see that amber was prized and used in decorations, particularly in women's jewelry and brooches, which came from the Baltic regions of Europe, and the particular and distinctive Terramar brooches and clothespins have been found in the eastern Mediterranean in places like Egypt, Minoan Crete, Mycenaean Greece, and Hittite Anatolia, or modern-day Turkey, and even occasionally as far away as the Crimean area of the Black Sea. They were heavily involved in forest management, which involved fruit trees, some slash-and-burn agriculture, culture as well as coppicing. Coppicing is where you cut the top of the tree at its base in a particular way to allow it to grow back with long straight shoots that are useful in harvesting for straight poles and posts. I recently did a short where I discussed coppicing, so check out my channel if you're interested. Speaking of poles and posts, now is a good time for us to talk about what the actual village and what their Terramar structures look like. The Terramar villages were rectangular or trapezoidal in shape and were surrounded by a stout embankment, sometimes which could reach a width of 30 meters or 100 feet deep, especially in the later periods. They likely also contained a protective palisade wall on top of the embankment as well. The whole of the village was surrounded by a moat, which was created by the Terramar diverting channels of the Po River so the village would be surrounded by the river itself. Channels were also dug for crop irrigations as well. Remember, this whole area tended to be quite marshy, and so by lowering the ground level around the village and using that dirt to build the embankment, a quite heavily protected structure could be created. The houses and structures within the village were typically of consistent size of around 60 to 100 square meters, or in other words, around 6 by 8 meters or 8 by 12 meters, which is around 25 by 40 feet. Roads and pathways within the village were laid out in a grid pattern with houses placed right next to each other. Interestingly, there's lots of evidence that when a house grew old or dilapidated, the house would be torn down and a new house would be built at the exact same place. This has led some to speculate that perhaps the houses were owned by families who also owned that plot of land in that village, and then perhaps what could be handed down from generation to generation. If so, this is a bit of an unusual practice comparative to other historical cultures. Normally, what you typically would see in a historical or archaeological context is that when a house is abandoned, a new house is built somewhere else in that village, and that the house wouldn't follow such a uniform and pre-planned layout. The other interesting thing about the houses is that they were built on piles, or in other words, poles or stilts. While this meant that it took more material to build the houses compared to if it was built right on the ground, by building it on stilts off the ground, that afforded the house a number of advantages. Keeping it off the ground helped protect it from vermin or bugs, but more importantly, it kept the structure drier. Remember, these villages were built surrounded by rivers, and the Po River Valley is quite marshy. Think about Venice for a moment, a city famous for having channels and canals as its city streets. Likely when there were storms that rolled up the Adriatic, or heavy rains, or increased snow in the Alps that caused more runoff, the groundwater table would rise, and so having your house off the ground helped build a buffer so your house wouldn't get flooded. It's also possible that the space under the house was used to store non-perishable supplies, or depending on how high up the piles were, would provide some shade to keep things cooler. Not all houses within the village were up on poles, however. Some buildings and houses were built on ground level, and beyond that detail, it doesn't appear that there was anything else different about those two style of houses. So basically, you have some houses that were built right on the ground and others built right next to them, built in the same exact style and dimensions, built on piles. So maybe it had something to do with how well off a family was and if they could afford to put their house on piles, or maybe it just came down to personal preference. So what happened to the Terramar? Well, let me tell you while I walk around and give you a little tour of this village. In the late Bronze Age, it seemed that the area started exhibiting a prolonged period of famine and climate disruption. This is described by Dionysus of Helicarnassus, who was writing about a thousand years after these events. So take this with a grain of salt. A thousand years is quite a long time. He said the Pelasgians, which is what Dionysus called the Terramar, after conquering a large and fertile region, taking over many towns and building others, did not long enjoy their prosperity. But at the moment when they seemed to all the world to be the most flourishing condition, 
they were visited by divine wrath. The first cause of this desolation of their cities seemed to be a drought which laid waste to the land. The rest of the people, also particularly those in the prime of life, were afflicted with many unusual diseases and uncommon deaths. So, in that quote, Dionysus points to drought and disease as the cause, and archaeologically, we can see a rapid decline in forested areas as well, which can be determined through the pollen record in that region, as well as an increasing shifting to keeping more goats as opposed to other livestock. Goats tend to keep better in arid temperatures as opposed to drier areas, and that also squares with other pollen samples that points to less plants that correspond to marsh and wetlands, and to a higher sample for those that keep better in drier and more arid climates. So long story short, it appears that there was an alteration in the climate at that time which changed the area from a wetter climate to one that was drier and that wasn't how the Terramar society and culture or even their buildings were set up to handle. The archaeology shows that within a short period of time, as in a generation or two, the Terramar villages were abandoned and the entire population left the area. That population is estimated to have been around 125,000 individuals. The area was afterwards depopulated for the next 300 to 400 years. Dionysus claims that the Pulaskians, as he calls them, moved south and merged with other Italian peoples and became the Terranians, or in other words, the Etruscans. If you're curious about the Etruscans, I have a video on my channel all about an Etruscan site you can check out. I don't think it was quite that simple, however, because if you look at the spread of artifacts around the Eastern Mediterranean, it appears that while I'm sure many of the Terramar merged and joined other tribes and cultures in Italy, you see their artifacts in Sicily and especially Mycenaean Greece. I also find it interesting that this all occurred to the Terramar just a couple of generations prior to the more widespread Bronze Age collapse, which, while not the purpose of this video, is a much bigger historical event that affected the Eastern Mediterranean during the transition from the Late Bronze Age into the early parts of the Iron Age. In the Bronze Age collapse, most of the established and powerful Bronze Age cultures and kingdoms in the Mediterranean were overthrown and brought low. This is when the collapse of the Mycenaean Greeks, the Minoans, the Hittite kingdoms occurred, and while the kingdom of Egypt didn't collapse, this is the era when they speak of being invaded by the Sea Peoples, and was a period of climate change and drought and famine. Perhaps the Terramar culture's collapse was one of the first dominoes to fall in this wider Bronze Age event that completely reshaped political power in the wider region. Well, that wraps up this video. I really hope that you like my recreation of the Bronze Age Terramar village and hope you find it useful as you might need to or want to build your own swamp village in Minecraft. Please take the time to like and subscribe if you're enjoying this content. I'm nearly at 500 subscribers, which is totally crazy since it's just been a month or so since we passed 250. I really appreciate all of your support. Thanks and have a great rest of your day. Bye for now.